going to make up time with a much shorter talk about single ventricle ones. So I'm going to speak specifically about, um, about prefontan stuff. So kind of what we as pediatric cardiologists deal with when we're looking at single ventricles, and we'll leave the Fontan talk up to Dr. Jones. Um, about five in 10,000 live births have some sort of single ventricle. That is a big grab bag term. It's a lot of different diseases to describe somebody that's got one functioning ventricle. Um, often we have these kind of true univentricular hearts. Frequently they'll have one big ventricle and one tiny little ventricle. Here's a double inlet left ventricle um, with a little VSD and a tiny little RV. Here's a mitral atresia here with this little slit-like LV and a big uh, functioning RV. And then there are the functional single ventricles. Well, yeah, you've got two ventricles, but for whatever reason you can't use one. One example would be really severe Epstein. So as part of Ari's talk, um, every once in a while we have an Epstein that's so bad that you're gonna have to go the single ventricle route. And what I mean by the single ventricle route is how are we gonna take this person with the single ventricle, stabilize their saturations, and hopefully normalize their saturations as we get them older. Um, and that's something that is often done in three stages and we will talk about that. So historically these patients presented with either with cyanosis, with acute decompensation if they had some sort of ductal dependent lesion and the duct is closed, or with progressive heart failure if they had too much pulmonary blood flow. But increasingly we're seeing this in utero. The OBs often pick up on this um, and so we have time to plan things which is nice. Our most important decision when this baby is born is, do I need a ductus arteriosus? Do I need to start prostaglandin to keep that ductus open? Um, here's a patient, an adult patient of mine with double inlet left ventricle, just a nice picture of that. Incidentally, to tie into Ryan's talk next, um, she has hepatocellular carcinoma and we're trying to figure out how to get her a heart liver transplant. Um, here's a patient where you would look at this and say, well, why do we need to do a single ventricle palliation on this patient. This is an AV canal, and it's not really evident by this echo, um, but the chordal attachments, the AV valve anatomy prevented that single valve from being septated into two valves. Um, and so this was a patient that ended up needing to go the single ventricle route despite having two really good sized ventricles. Um, here's a patient with tricuspid atresia. No tricuspid valve here. You've got blue blood that's going to shunt across, mixed with the pink blood, into the aorta, into the LV. Most of it out the aorta, but some is going to go across this little VSD into the RV and out a pulmonary valve that you can't see in this picture. Here's a patient with pulmonary atresia, um, which was mentioned earlier. You can't see the pulmonary atresia here, but what you can see is this teeny tiny, cute little tricuspid valve um, with this tiny little right ventricle that's kind of worthless. Another example of single ventricle lesions. All right, so how do these patients do? I threw this in because I'm in Houston and Doug Moody um, is around. And, and basically this was a study looking at single ventricles, but really importantly, not hypoplastic left heart syndrome, which a lot of people just plain ignored until the 80s because everyone died, you couldn't do anything. So these single ventricles, not hypoplasts, um, pretty rare for them to live into teenage years without some sort of intervention. Um, and often, here's the problem. So you may have too little pulmonary blood flow. Here's my triatresia, there's no VSD, blood can't get from the LV to the RV to go across this pulmonary valve, which is a tretic here. I need a ductus arteriosus to get blood to the lungs. So this is a kid that absolutely needs to get started on prostin. Look at this patient though. This patient has a big VSD. This patient has a good sized pulmonary valve. They don't need prostaglandin. They're gonna be able to have some of this blood from the LV go across the VSD out to the pulmonary arteries. Yeah, they'll be blue, but their saturations will be adequate. And in fact, as this baby's pulmonary vascular resistance starts to fall, we're gonna overcirculate to the lungs and get into heart failure issues. And every once in a while, we get this perfect baby where there's a VSD, but maybe it's not too big, or there's a pulmonary valve, but maybe it's a little bit stenotic, and we can get enough blood flow out to the lungs to keep your saturations adequate, but not so much that we're in heart failure. This kid, sometimes we can skip the first stage of our palliation, and then just go to the Glenn operation when they're three or six 
months old. We'll talk about that in a minute. So um, triatresia, uh, this is a patient who absolutely needs to be placed on prostaglandin to keep that ductus open. Pulmonary, uh, ductal dependent pulmonary circulation. Now this is gonna contrast, oh actually, so what do we do for that? We're gonna have to do something because you can't go home on prostaglandin. Um, so instead, they're gonna get a shunt. And of course, the blaylock talsic thomas shunt um, back in the, the mid-40s was the, the first real palliation for a lot of these diseases. The subclavian artery was flat down, connected to the pulmonary arteries. So basically, a man-made ductus arteriosus. There are a whole lot of different types of shunts. We have our classic BT shunt here. What is typically done nowadays is a modified blaylock talsic thomas shunt with a Gore-Tex tube. The, what I was taught, the Waterston shunt, but I'm in, I'm in Houston, so I should call it a Cooley shunt, I guess, and a pot shunt. Really, these we don't see anymore. This we still see a whole lot of. What about hypoplastic left heart syndrome? This is totally different, right? We don't need the ductus arteriosus to get blood to the lungs. Here, we need it to get blood to the body. So pink blood comes into the left atrium, can't go into this LV, has to cross the atrial septum, mix with the blue blood, out the pulmonary arteries, and now I need that ductus arteriosus to get blood down to the body, but also to get blood up to the head and even way down the acin and aorta to the coronaries. Um, so very different circulation. Here's some pictures of that. Um, with the tiny little LV here. You can see here's the aorta with the hypoplastic ascent in aorta. This is actually pretty big for some of our hypoplasts. But for people who look at a lot of echo, you see red blood. It's the blood is coming up from the ductus into the uh, aortic arch and back down to supply the coronaries. All right, so pediatric cardiology, um, in a nutshell, this is really all we do is talk about QP, pulmonary blood flow, QS, systemic blood flow. We're gonna make a lot of assumptions with this patient with hypoplastic left heart. We're gonna assume mixed venous saturations coming back into the right atrium is about 60%. Pulmonary venous saturations are about 100%. If those, if the 60 and the 100 mixes, it all comes here and exactly half of it goes to the body and half of it goes to the lungs, my QPQS ratio is one to one and I'm gonna have Half 60 mixing with half 100, my SATs will be about 80%. But what happens as the pulmonary vascular resistance starts to fall and blood wants to go to the lungs, not to the body? Well, I may end up with five times more blood going to the lungs than to the body. Five times more 100% blood mixing with that 60% blood, SATs at 93%. So high SATs aren't good. High SATs mean I'm getting too much blood to my lungs, and that's stressing out this right ventricle, which ha is having to squeeze like five, six times more blood than it's supposed to. And it's also kind of flooding the lungs at the expense of my systemic circulation. So more pulmonary blood flow, but even less coronary blood flow, which I'm really gonna need. So what is bad for this patient? Anything that raises systemic vascular resistance is gonna push more blood to the lungs. Anything that lowers pulmonary vascular resistance is gonna push more stuff to the lungs. So what happens if this kid comes in sick and acidotic and you can't feel pulses and they're a week old? You're gonna give them some epi and start bagging them really quick because you're freaking out and they're gonna spiral downward even worse, um, which is where it's really useful to make this diagnosis before the kid goes home and preferably before the kid is born. So we're going to um, minimize our FiO2 because too much oxygen will lower your PVR. And if you're not on prostin yet, that oxygen could actually cause the ductus to close. We're gonna give them volume, correct any acidosis. Um, the neonatal myocardium is really sensitive to calcium, so we're gonna make sure they get calcium if they need it. And we're not gonna hyperventilate them. We're gonna to try to keep their PCO2s kind of 40 to 50, um, not in the 30s. Um, if they're really bad off, we'll sedate and paralyze them to kind of decrease the effect of stress and oxygen demands in a stressed out baby. And certainly we're going to put them on prostaglandin. And then they're going to get a really big surgery, a much bigger surgery than that BT shunt that we talked about to get pulmonary blood flow. This is a Norwood operation, a stage one palliation for hypoplastic left heart. We're going to take the pulmonary valve and we're going to use it to become an aortic valve.
So the proximal pulmonary artery here has been connected to the aorta. It's all been patched. Well, now we don't have any pulmonary blood flow, so this kid has a shunt in place to get pulmonary blood flow. More and more now we use a right ventricle to pulmonary artery shunt instead, a SANO shunt. Um, but now we're basically to the same point as that triatresia who's had a shunt. Um, so we're going to go back to that triatresia who's had a shunt. This kid can go home, but they're blue, right? They still have blue blood mixing with pink blood going out the aorta, and some of that blood's going down the shunt to the ventricle, I mean, to the, to the pulmonary arteries. And this ventricle is stressed because every time it squeezes, it's got to provide enough blood to go to the body enough blood to go to the lungs, so I've got this volume overloaded ventricle. So what to do about that? The initial Glenn operation was just connecting the superior vena cava to the right pulmonary artery. Typically now we do a bidirectional Glenn, meaning the SVC is connected to the pulmonary arteries. Um, so you're still blue with this physiology. The blue blood from the IVC is mixing with the pink blood going out the aorta, um, but this ventricle is a lot happier because you've gotten rid of that shunt. Now all it has to do is pump blood out to the body. So that is our second stage palliation um, that we typically do around three to six months of age at about five kilograms or so. Um, and then next we will talk about the Fontan. Um, but just to say it, because I think there is this dogma out there that everybody needs a Fontan, um, there are patients living out there who have just had glens. Um, and yeah, they're blue, but they're adults and they're living. Um, and I raise that because Dr. Jones is going to talk a lot about potential uh, negative outcomes from the Fontan operation, more data looking at kind of patients with, with um, shunts and with uh, glens followed in adulthood um, who did relatively well. So finally, what happens, that patient we talked about before, here who has too much pulmonary blood flow. We talked about shunting this patient. We talked about doing nothing with this patient and then doing a Glenn when they're about three to six months old. How about with this patient who has too much pulmonary blood flow, what can we do? And often that's a pulmonary arterial band, which is just what it sounds like. The surgeon ties a, a string around the pulmonary artery to create pulmonary stenosis to a point where you've got enough pulmonary blood flow but not so much pulmonary blood flow that you're in heart failure and not so much, um, so much pulmonary blood flow that you've got significantly elevated PA pressures. So sometimes that PA band is our next procedure. And I believe that's it. Excellent. Thank you.